And welcome back. Now, Eskom has been dealt a blow in the courts. It had wanted the court to allow it to raise billions of rands by increasing electricity prices in order to solve the liquidity challenges that it faces. Now, the North Gauteng High Court dismissed es- Eskom's application, saying the matter was not urgent and the bid would have seen Eskom hike electricity tariffs by 16% over the next two years. Now, the merits of the 69 billion rand cash injection allocation by Treasury to Eskom for the next three years in the budget will still be heard as part B of the review process. Meanwhile, the Federation of Unions of South Africa, FEDUSA, wants Eskom to be placed under business rescue. So to help us unpack and, you know, perhaps get greater clarity on what exactly is at play here, we're joined by geologist and energy expert Clyde Mallinson. Thanks for coming through, Clyde. Pleasure. Pleasure. Perhaps worth uh, taking a few steps back and, and, and just looking at the role of NURSA. What exactly are they meant to do? NURSA is meant to adjudicate electricity tariffs in South Africa and they're meant to undertake a balancing act. So they need to ensure that ESCOM receive a high enough tarant, tariff to remain viable and to be able to operate and produce electricity for the country. And at the same time, NURSA... Nurse's second role is to protect the consumer in terms of tariff shocks or tariff hikes. And the idea is to, to have a smooth increase in tariffs over time where one can be devoid of massive short-term shocks. So that's really the role. It's a balancing act between uh, a high enough tariff to allow ESCOM to be viable and to make a small annual profit um, which can be reused for capital expand, expansion at the same time as protecting the, confu- the consumer from paying too high a tariff in, his, in essentially what's a monopoly. ESCOM essentially has a monopoly. And in a monopoly, if it was just allowed to set its own tariffs, it could, it could, it could, it, it's, it's regulated basically because of that. So coming to the court processes that have subsequently mm-hmm. ensued, uh, why was it necessary to get to that point? Why was it necessary for ESCOM to bring an application for this matter to be heard urgently? Well, ESCOM applied for uh, approximately three years of 16 or so percent tariff increases in its most recent application. And it's, it's actually quite a long, complex process. They're allowed to seek a tariff that covers the operational costs, the primary energy costs, the operation and maintenance. It allows for a, a small profit to be made on the asset base. And they, they applied for that tariff, and that tariff, they, as they calculated, it was approximately a 16% increase. NURSA then, during the process of, of adjudicating that tariff, at about that time, the government injected 69 billion rand into NURSA over a three-year period to alleviate NURSA's big debt problem. Uh, we all, I think, know that NURSA carries a debt of about 450 billion. So NURSA injected what's referred to as an equity injection. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the government did, in, injected mm-hmm. that. And NURSA viewed that as additional income to to ESCOM and therefore said, right, we'll give you what you ask for minus 23 billion. So they said, instead of giving you 16%, we'll give you 9% or whatever it was. And the, the court case is the moment is basically es- ESCOM questioning the validity of NURSA being allowed to say that that equity injection was part of the operational profits. So as and that's a- the nub of it. As as an energy expert, Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us your view on that? Was it a revenue injection? Uh, Who's correct (coughs) in terms of how they're interpreting this? My view is that it was was an injection uh, uh, meant to alleviate their their debt. And it would have been nice to see that injection pay off their debt. The reality of the situation is that even with that injection, ESCOM actually need that injection now simply to survive and service their debt. The injection isn't big enough for them to actually pay off some of the capital. So they're really just servicing debt. Um, and it's, really a, a, it's been a long-term process where it's reached this point. Um, if we dial back about 12 years, ESCOM used to get about $40 billion a year income. So just think about that, $40 billion. 
they now get around about 200 billion 12 years later and you sort of think to yourself well if you were managing on 40 and you're now getting 200 gee there must have been some significant changes that happened and of course the main change that happened is they tried to build Madupi and Kasili and they don't seem to have done it in in a normal way where you borrow money because you're going to build new plant and you 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 don't sort of try and pay off that money with tariff increases you it's like a bond on your house you don't you don't pay off your house in the first three years you get a long-term loan and you you look to pay that off and of course what's happened is there's been cost and time overruns on Madupi and Kasili so they're now in a position where where their debt servicing has become a major. I think it, if, if it's not the biggest cost now, it's certainly the second or the third biggest cost after uh, primary energy staff and servicing debt. So it, it, it's like anyone, if you get into a debt trap, you're kind of caught there and it just seems to grow on you. And, and, and is this perhaps something that NURSA <laughs> is taking into consideration um, in addition to all the other problems that ESCOM has at a governance level? My, my basic feeling is I've presented at most of the NURSA hearings where there's been an application for, a, for an increase. And every time I've presented, and it must be about half a dozen times now, all my presentations have ignored how much should NURSA give ESCOM. In every presentation I've said NURSA and ESCOM together need to get to the core issues of why ESCOM's costs are overrunning to the extent they are. Because nurses meant to grant ESCOM increases based on efficient and prudent use. So efficient operation, prudent use of funds. And, and basically over the last 10 years, nurses has been overseeing essentially the state capture of ESCOM. Uh, and yet when you say to NURSA, well, did ESCOM spend pr prudently and efficiently, they say, well, we, we, we can't really dig into ESCOM because that's not our ambit. And you kind of ask yourself, well, if you can't go and undertake a technical, f financial, forensic audit of ESCOM, then, then who can? And how on earth can you then? So it's become very mechani me mechanistic. You know, and, this is the convoluted. price. Here. Because it's, it's, how can nurses say that this is not their ambit, yet they are meant to oversee the prudent spend of this um, of revenue that is given to ESCOM? So on what basis are they then giving ESCOM these monies every year? Well, well, what's happened is they've devised a fairly complex methodology of saying what ESCOM's allowed to charge as a tariff. So these big formulas, you take this, you take how, ma how many assets ESCOM have, you you add on the cost of coal and you look at it and, you, and you, you do a sort of sum and you come up with a tariff. ESCOM then says, well, that tariff, um, uh, we, they actually estimate how much they're going to sell. So then they divide that tariff by how much they're going to sell. They divide the amount they want in a year by what they're going to sell and they come up with a tariff. Now, they've always been, oh, the last couple of years or the last 10 years, they've over-predicted how much they're going to sell. So then they undersell and said that the tariff is too low because we thought we were going to get 200 billion. We divide by what we're going to sell. We come up with a tariff. If we then sell less than we thought we were, we short. And so there's a whole lot of mechanisms in place that allow them to claw back what, what they didn't earn because they overestimated their sales. And of course, as the tariff climbs, their, their sales drop because people simply can't afford it. So it's, it's, it's the thing called the death spiral, mm. but, the but utility but death spiral. Is this a real, um, you know, sparring <coughs> between Eskom and NURSA, or is this just grandstanding? No, I don't think it's grand. I think it's sparring, but I think it's sparring where the people who are sparring haven't, haven't learnt all the rules or looked at all the solutions. You know, maybe they need to go from boxing to cage fighting. I'm not sure where they're allowed to kick as well. <laughs> but at the moment, it's, it's, it's an endless, I, I call it the annual tango. You know, ESCOM sort of pushes for a 16% with NURSA backpedaling, and then NURSA pushes back in the other direction, if you can envisage a tango. And they eventually settle on a price, and it's all, it's all documented and correct. But they're focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing on that tariff. 
And I've said over and over again, lower tariff, bigger bailout, higher tariff, smaller bailout, until we sort out the whole in electricity supply industry. We need to actually make major changes to the industry to sort it out. But is that going to happen? It will in happen. In the foreseeable future. It will happen. In the same way, I hate to say this, but the end of apartheid came about because of economic pressure. There wasn't a whole bunch of people in power who woke up one morning and said, I'm tired of being in power, let's, let's. It was basically economic pressure. And ESCOM, the ESCOM situation is, is mirroring that position um, where, where there's a financial paying off your debt with your credit card, paying off your credit card with a new credit card, and eventually when we get to that economic wall, things will have to change. But along the line, the alternatives have become less expensive than ESCOM now. So when, when alternatives first came onto the scene, ESCOM didn't regard them as a major threat. It's a small little amount. They're so expensive, they'll never be a threat to us. Now they're cheaper than what ESCOM can produce. And suddenly you say, gee, that thing we thought would never become a threat is now a major threat. So ESCOM are, I don't know, they're like a caged animal up against the wall fighting for their survival. And we conflate too often the survival of ESCOM versus the survival of the South African economy. Mm. And but, I'm, yeah. But, but if we look at ESCOM and um, basically how ESCOM has funded its operations over the years, um, you know, you look at cost plus mines, for example, you look yes. at the IPPs and uh, the funding that goes into mm -hmm. that. Is that still logical in 2020? Well, you know, cost plus mines are something that people, I'm not sure they fully understand it, and it's difficult to believe this, but ESCOM used to be able to borrow money more cheaply than mining companies because of its high credit rating. It was so esteemed it could borrow money. So the deal it did is it said, we don't know how to mine coal, but we'll capitalize a coal mine because we can borrow money cheaper than Anglo-American or BHP or South 32. Therefore, we will capitalize it. We will then hand it over to one of these mining companies. We'll ask them to mine it, and they will charge us whatever it costs them to mine plus a reasonable margin. And then, of course, those mines have run their course. They were designed for perhaps 40 years. They're feeding a particular power station for 40 years. And then they ran out of, of mine, and they said, well, we need to recapitalize. We need to sink a new shaft or strip a new area and mine, and we, we, they went to ESCOM and said, please give us the capital, because that's how it works. And that's when, I think it was Malefi who said, we want to buy bread, we don't want to own the bakery. You might remember that statement. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he was missing the point there. And the problem is, in that, in that interim period, the credit worthiness of ESCOM had dropped. So the model of ESCOM still paying the capital on a cost plus mine had kind of disappeared. And this is my point. Yes. In 2020, given yes. how the objective realities have shifted, yes. you know, mm -hmm. shouldn't everything be under review at this point? <coughs> uh, certainly. What, what really happened then is the mine said, OK, if we have to capitalize the expansion, we're going to probably charge you three times as much for the coal because that's how it works. Uh, if you buy a car, you pay two-thirds of your money is the finance, not the petrol and the tires and the insurance. So if you capitalize a new coal mine, two-thirds of the cost of running that coal mine is paying off the money you borrowed to capitalize it. And that's why it seemed unreasonable when the big mining companies came along and said, well, we were charging you 100 rand a tonne. We now have to charge you 300 rand a tonne, but we'll put in the capital. That was the difference. So what everyone's missing at the moment is that the cost of replacements have dropped so dramatically that South Africa stands in a wonderful position at the moment because the coal fleet is undeniably busy decommissioning itself. We talk about when we're going to decommission the coal fleet. Well, half of it's shut down as we sit here, either on planned maintenance or actually broken. The replacement fleet will actually cost us a lot less than trying to go get new coal mines opened. And that's really the message of hope. And, and, and also we're going to need about three to four times the amount of electricity we currently use 
in the very new in the very near future because everything's going to go electrical cars buses trains uh, in in industry so we actually need and, and I hate to say it like this, we need four ESCOMs, not one. And at the moment, there seems to be a fight over the single ESCOM. And no one seems to have appreciated it's going to have to grow to four times its size. So there's room for private-public partnerships, there's room for IPPs, and there's room for an ESCOM that's double its current size. Mm. But it's just got to grasp the metal and go for it. And, and, and just a final one as far as NERSA goes, and mm -hmm. they are currently on these roadshows that they undertake yes, um, yes. annually. But where does that leave the consumer? Does the consumer really have a say in terms of how these uh, price determinations actually pan out in the end? It, 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 because, of, because of the, I, I suppose be, it's really the, the, over, the cost overruns of Madupi and Kasili. If that had worked, we'd probably be paying about... 20 to 30 percent less for electricity than we're now paying. And so the, the consumer, to, to say the least, is confused. I don't know if you realize, for every hour of every stage of load shedding we have, it costs us about 100 million rand. So as we're sitting here talking, if, 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 if you have an, a three-hour show in the morning and we've got stage one load shedding, that's 300 million rand to the economy. So we need to do something urgently to first of all uh, fix the current state of load shedding and then secondly build out towards a future renewable fleet that will service those needs that, that, that I mentioned. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, geologist and energy expert Clyde Mallinson. Unpacking certain issues relating to the stalemate between Eskom and NERSA that saw Eskom taking the national regulator to court. And, of course, uh, they will be back in court uh, in not too long from now. We're going to take a break. and.